Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 10 of the Nothing But Respect Podcast in association with Hell Hell Media. I'm joined this week by OC Boy. How you doing, OC? I'm very well. And a special guest this week, all the way from Sao Paulo, Ewan Marshall, who's a Celtic supporting football writer working in Brazil. Uh, I was going to say how things in Brazil, Ewan, but it's pretty uh, obvious how things are there. Uh, what's the feeling like in Brazil today? Ah uh, yeah, so yeah. First of all, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, so it's it's been a really difficult last few days. Um, we saw saw the news early on Tuesday morning that this uh, the plane carrying the Chapecoense team who were going to Medellin, in Colombia, to play the first leg of the Copa Sudamericana final. It's obviously. Yeah, the, the plane crashed in the early hours of Tuesday morning, and um, on a f- uh, 71 folk died in the accident, and we had only six survivors, three of them uh, being players of Chapecoense. And so, I mean, obviously for me as well, working in this, um, working in sports journalism in Brazil, it hit really uh, very close to home. Um, I didn't personally know any of the journalists who were on the flight, um, but I've I've ran into a couple of them a few times, and I've got a few friends who um, who knew them quite well. Um, so you've got like the the football community, the journalism community, and just in general, just the Brazilian community as a whole, just completely um, devastated. Um, because obviously, just a, it's a massive tragedy, huge loss of life. And uh, it really couldn't have happened um, to, a, to a more kind of sympathetic club as well, like uh, Chapecoense. It's just an amazing story that they've, they've they've been building down there for the past few years. Yeah, so it, I, it's a bit um, a few days have passed, but it's still it's still quite raw, mm. quite difficult well, still. We've seen a lot of uh, stuff coming through back here in Scotland about. Uh, the response from Brazilian teams say, I think there's you know there's a lot of conflicting reports about who's donating money to Chapa Quincy and who's not. Is if the club issued any sort of well, what's left of the club if they issued any sort of response? It's I, I it's a strange one because you yeah, definitely we're seeing this not only from Brazilian clubs uh, but clubs all over the world. Um, Talking about giving some sort of support to Chapecoense, but it's 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 not really clear exactly what each club's going to do and 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 when. Um, but the one thing that uh, does seem to be uh, putting in place at the moment is that uh, a number of Brazilian clubs are going to uh, they're going to sign a um, a resolution and hand over to the to the to the FA. Requesting that Chapecoense are going to be exempt from from relegation for the next three seasons, and they've also pledged to loan players uh, to Chapecoense for free and paying their salaries, all that sort of thing. And we've seen some some other types of offers from other clubs around the world. And Benfica, we're talking about uh, loaning players to Chapecoense, uh, the Paraguay team, Libertad. Who actually played uh, Chapecoense in the Sudamericana this year? Uh, they suggested that they would put their whole team, they, they would they would offer the whole team, the whole first team, and for Chapecoense to uh, Chapecoense to use to kind of rebuild. And yes, I mean it's, it's it's been really nice to see all these kind of offers of, of, of things that are going on. But I mean at the moment, the situation down in Chapeco is just it's it's an absolute madhouse at the moment. I've got a, a few colleagues are down there. Um, Covering the situation for for various kind of international news outlets, and then um, it's the thing is, I mean, we forget that you had 19, 19 of their squad were killed, but at the same time, um, a large number of the coaching staff and a large number of the of the board and the administration um, were uh, also died in the crash. So I mean, you you hardly get anyone left. Um, the vice president, who's who's now the acting president, uh, he he didn't get on the flight because he wasn't feeling well um, on the day, and, and he's, he's now 
basically the only one from the board who's who, who, who was spared. And you've only got a couple of other guys down there. You've got one. Uh, you've got one press officer who's having to handle everything, basically. Um, so you know, we're seeing like really kind of. We're not seeing a lot of a uh, lot of statements coming out from Shabakwansi because they find it really difficult to talk to the media because I mean, you just get so many requests and there's hardly any of them left, you know. Um, but yeah, we'll just see how that goes over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, if nobody knows you. I've not seen it yet. You wrote an article for the Independent about this the other day, which was a, a terrific read. We're going to tweet the link uh, after this, but just a few things that I noticed is what you said is they're still a relatively young club. You know, they're only established in the nineteen seventies, uh, and they don't have many, well, any kind of notable rivals. Yeah, um, well, it's interesting because you've got well. When this came out uh, on, on, on Tuesday, when everyone started to hear about the news and what had happened, uh, you get a lot of people from all around the world basically asking, like, who, who is this club? I've never heard of them. Uh, they're in the final of this, of this uh, South American tournament, but I've never, never heard their name before. Um, and with good reason, because, I mean, they, they really... There's a lot of folk in Brazil who'd never heard of them until a few years ago. Um, and even in their, their home state of... Uh, Santa Catarina, which is down in the south, they are. I, I think I'm right in saying that they're the fourth best supported club in that state, and it's not a terribly big state. Um, yeah. So you've got they basically they just come from this city of Chapecó, which is um, it's quite a well-off city. Um, it's 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 fairly well developed, but essentially they've just managed to get the whole the whole city behind this one club. Because I mean they're the only team in town, so they don't really have any direct rivals. Um, everyone kind of likes them, you know. They've always really stood out for their their kind of their team spirit and um, the atmosphere when you go and play there is really quite uh, really quite intimidating, really hard place to go and win. Um, and so they've managed to build up build up this reputation. And as I say, I mean it couldn't have happened. To, a more kind of well liked and sympathetic club in Brazil, you know. Yeah, it seems like uh, I know we always say this about when tragedy does strike in football, but everybody seems to rally around. Now, I watched the Colo Colo game last night and they had a, a really good, uh, I think it was Ave Maria the guy sang before the game, and it was a really good show of strength. Uh, is this, I mean, obviously, I don't recall any more air disasters, but is the spirit shown by the Teams in Brazil is that fairly was it expected? Well, yeah, I'd I'd, I'd say so um, because well, I mean it's, it's it's the first time it's the first time I I, I remember um, anything like this happening in Brazilian football, yeah. um, but it certainly happened in, in Brazilian society quite a few times. I mean, last last year. Uh, just a few a few weeks ago to the day, um, we had the the big dam disaster in uh, in Minas Gerais, where um, quite a few people lost their lives. This massive uh, environmental disaster, and then just a couple of years ago, um, I don't know if you guys saw this, but we, there was the the nightclub fire as well in the south of Brazil, which killed, I think it was over a hundred uh, over a hundred uh, teenagers and and, and twenty somethings. So I mean, these kind of tragedies have happened in Brazil, and it's the reaction is always kind of the same. Um, you've got um, it's a very it's a very emotional country, and in situations like this, just you know, total tragedy, everyone just kind of gets behind, um, just gets behind the the families and those connected, and it was just nice to see that as well in football because I mean, I've, I've personally, I'm I'm not that surprised. That the um, the reaction has been so um, it's been so kind of tender and and, and, and really quite human uh, from all the other clubs and all the supporters of the other clubs because at the end of the day in Brazil the rivalries that you have between football clubs are essentially uh, just all about football and um, it's kind of local bragging rights all that sort of stuff. There's not the same sort of uh, there's not the same sort of vitriol that that you'd see in in Glasgow, for example, um, and in Britain. So you know, it, it, a lot of the rivalries are really kind of sporting rivalries, and so it's just nice to have, have, have seen the kind of the human side, all that shine through. 
and I'm sure we've seen a lot of amazing tributes already and we're going to see uh, loads more over the next few weeks I'm sure Has there been any word on the well obviously they're not going to play the Sudamericana final but I've seen Nassi now would offer to award the trophy to Shaka Quincy uh, which would be a, a great uh, tribute but I mean where did Shaka Quincy go for here uh, I mean will they appear in the state championships next month or um well, uh, you you wouldn't you wouldn't think so. Um, the the interesting thing actually about the Sudamericana final is that I'm I'm not actually one hundred percent sure that they're not going to play that. Um, they've Atletico Nacional have have uh, they've essentially conceded uh, they've essentially conceded the title, but it seems like the most likely uh, thing that would happen would be the title would be shared between the two clubs. And but at the same time, uh, Conmebol, the South American Football Confederation, um, like they've already made, a, a, like this sounds horrible, but they've already made all sorts of kind of commercial deals and things like that to do with these two finals. Yeah. But I would be really surprised if uh, if nothing happened, and um, either like maybe play it next year or something like that, and just have the kind of leave an asterisk behind beside the 2016 champion. And play the final sometime next year. I don't know, um, but I, I, I would be surprised if they if they didn't do something like that. But I mean, Conmebol, you can't really expect that much from them. I mean, they they, they change their minds all the time. So um, who knows how that's going to go? In terms of how how Chapecoense are going to survive um, in the short term, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm sure that with with all these loan players that they're going to get in from these other clubs in Brazil and perhaps around South America, even um, even from Europe, who knows? I'm sure that with with that sort of support, they'll be able to put together um, at least a kind of semi-competitive team, and they will be exempt from relegation. So I'm sure that they will uh, they will continue, especially with the kind of the the, the support that they have from the community. Um, but yeah, we've just got to wait and see, really. Uh, as I say, Chapecoense themselves, the club, what's left of the club, they haven't been haven't been making a lot of a lot of statements, you know. So they're just trying to do what they can at the moment. I think, I think over the next couple of weeks we'll start to see um, what their plans are and, and exactly what kind of support they're going to get from other clubs from the league. Uh, perhaps from the broadcasters as well. There was talk of um, them getting a much bigger share of the television rights than they would usually get for next year. See what happens with that. But yeah, just got to wait and see. I think. I seen you tweeted last night that the Brazilian FA are actually put pressure on them to play this weekend. It's... Yeah, it's a. Uh... It's actually uh, it, it, this is the this is the story that I'm I'm writing at the moment. Um, just when you called, it's it's quite a bit bizarre kind of situation. So they've basically they had a, the vice president of Chapecoense, who's, who's the interim president at the moment. He was speaking on the phone to the the Brazilian FA president yesterday, and. The Brazilian FA president was basically telling him that this game against Atlético Mineiro, their last game in the season, uh, that this has to take place. They have to play, um, and that he wants to, in the words, because the problem with this is, is it's we're going by, we're going off the word of the Chapecoense vice president. So I can't, I can't, I can't say exactly what the uh, FA president said, but so he, he suggested that they have to play it. And they're going to make a big sort of celebration out of it. A big party, actually, was the words that um, the Chapecoense vice president um, used. And when he replied, we don't have 11 players, uh, Marco Polo Del Nero, the FA president, said, well, you do have 11 players. You've got the youth team and you've got the guys who didn't travel. Um, so, you know, just we don't care about the result. Just get 11 players out in the pitch and... And let's have a game, um, which is just, you know, just ridiculously <laughs> insensitive, you know. Right, so we got you on because you're a Celtic supporter abroad. Uh, All right, obviously, right. <laughs> yeah, obviously, you know, the Chapa Quincy thing takes precedence, but as a Celtic podcast, uh, 
we'd like to discuss about a Celtic. So, how has it been a Celtic supporter in Sao Paulo? Uh, do you get, I mean, do you wear the hoops often? Do you get noticed? Or? Um, I well, I'm, a, I'm actually, I'm actually wearing my hoops right now. Actually, as as, as coincidence may have, but yeah, it's it's an odd one. Um, you get a lot of like the kind of the the football hipster thing has 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 arrived in Brazil over the last couple of years. So you get a lot of people kind of kicking about town with some you might say kind of random football shirts. So I've seen a few I've seen a few Celtic shirts around. Um, seen a couple of seen a couple of Rangers shirts actually as well. <laughs> but, I mean, uh, um, prefer not to mention that. But yeah, um, they are Celtic. Obviously, as a globally. Uh, renowned club are well known here. I mean, if I'm out with out with my shirt on, I'll, I will get recognised, and people will, will, you know, have some sort of story about Celtic, some sort of player that they might know. Usually, uh, Henrik um, yeah. is the kind of first reference that I get. But yeah, um, and especially among because of since coming here, um, started following uh, Palmeiras. Yep. The uh, one of the biggest clubs here in São Paulo, and they play they play in green and white as well as luck may have it. And yeah, so among the Palmeiras fans as well, there's certainly this uh, there's a bit of affinity um, for Celtic, and to be honest, all teams that play in in green and white. So sometimes at a Palmeiras game, you might see someone, uh, you might see a couple of people in the crowd with Celtic shirts on or. Uh, maybe Atletico Nacional or uh, Real Betis, you know, and all these kind of green and white teams. And um, so there seems to be this sort of affinity going on. It's quite, it's quite nice. Uh. Have you seen much of Celtic this season? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I like to. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, I like to catch all the uh, all the games that I can, and um, it's all right just now because of the the time zone is actually kind of. It kind of suits me at the moment because there's only yeah. two hours of difference. Um, but earlier, uh, when it's when it's winter here, when it's summer over there, uh, so at the start of the season, uh, the time difference is, is is four hours. So that means me getting up to watch Celtic at eight in the morning, which is a bit of a bit of a nightmare, um, especially like. I don't know when you're playing Inverness Cali or St Johnston or something like that. It's, it's sometimes you don't feel like it's worth getting up for, yep. but you know, I make the effort. And Sunday must have been a good day because Palmeiras won the league title and Celtic won the league cup. So that must have been a good day for a Celtic fan living in. It was. South yeah, Island. yeah I, I was actually I was mentioning this uh, to the guys. I went, cause I, I was at the game um, actually on Sunday, and. Uh, Tragically enough, that was uh, that was also Shapikwensi's yep. last game because um, yep. it was Palmeiras against Shapikwensi. And I saw so us at the game on Sunday, and uh, beforehand, before we went into the stadium, just hanging out with a few friends uh, in the pub, and I mentioned um, that Celtic had, had had won the League Cup that day, just like about an hour earlier, and uh, managed to get a bunch of Palmeiras fans to. Sing a wee round of Champions for uh, <laughs> for Celtic and plenty of free drinks going around, which was nice. But yeah, I mean, as I say, there, there is this sort of affinity between the be, between like for the Palmeiras fans, like oh well, you know, Celtic must be my Scottish team because they play in green and white. Yeah. So yeah, it was nice, definitely two titles in one day, very good. It's not often that that happens. No, it's not. And uh, just to finish off, here with you. Yeah. Is there any hidden gems Celtic should be looking at in Brazil, or is the work permit issue is putting paid to that? Ah, uh, yeah, the work, the work permits are, are an absolute nightmare. Um, we've got like the thing is, I think Celtic. Uh, I've heard this discussed before by a few um, different uh, Celtic fans online that perhaps Celtic should really start looking into the South American market. Because I mean, it's 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 not it's not one that we have really a lot of experience in. Um, like if you're talking about uh, Brazilian players that have, have, have played at Celtic, I can only remember Juninho Paulista and obviously the man himself, uh, <laughs> Afel Shite. And it's 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 
I mean, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure that there's, there's a lot of talent here, but the problem is is that Celtic just don't have. Um, we don't really have any representation here in terms of scouting, and you've got so many other major clubs in Europe who are already uh, just really have their claws some really deep into a lot of these clubs in terms of uh, scouting young talent. And um, so Celtic really need to get a move on if they want to. Um, if they don't have a chance of getting any of these young players. And I mean, obviously, the way that it goes these days is that it used to be you could recommend someone who's playing in the first division here, uh, like in the top division in Brazil, you could recommend him to some scout in for a European team and maybe he wouldn't have heard him and maybe there's a chance of signing him. But I mean, these days, the scouts, they know everyone. You've, you've got to go down to like your kind of under-18 level um, to really get anyone to have any chance of, of, of you know finding some sort of undiscovered star. you know. Um, but there's plenty of talent here. There's plenty of talent in South America. Uh, especially around in Chile and in Argentina and Uruguay. And, you know, if Celtic just kind of got their act together in terms of scouting in South America, uh, could could look to bring in a few really talented youngsters. Yeah, hopefully in the future we, we see a few more because, as you say, the current standard of Rafael and Jorinho, uh, when it hard to match that or exceed it, so... I thought, yeah, I mean, I've always games. wondered. I mean, I look, I look at, I look at like European leagues or just leagues around the world. And they've always got Brazilian players. You know, it's only Scotland that doesn't get Brazilian players. It's the only one. Anyway. So all it left to say is thanks for taking the time you to join us because I know it must be hectic uh, in Brazil at the minute. So nothing better. Yeah, not a bother. For uh, joining us and uh, stay safe uh, out there. Keep us up to date with anything that's happening. Uh, we'll put a link to your article and your Twitter uh, out. Oh, great, cheers. Happy for people just to follow you and ask questions. Yeah, excellent. Aye, so if you're if you are wanting to see um, or want to read anything um, that I put out, that's it. Just follow me on Twitter. I've got the uh, it's at Ewan Marshall. Uh, Ewan is E U A N. So anything I do, I'll just stick up on there. So I follow me there. Thanks very much for joining us. Not a not a problem. It was a pleasure. Right, cheers, bye. Cheers, cheers, man. Bye. So back to Celtic matters. Yeah, we had a small business of winning the league cup on Sunday. Down you were at Hamden. Yeah, was that a, a? I don't think it was a normal bad day at Hamden, was it? Ah uh, well, well, as Brendan Rodgers says in his press conference before it. it wasn't his team, it wasn't him, so I think I'm quite happy to sort of forget some of the bad days we had at hand because the twice that Brendan Rodgers has went there, we've now went and absolutely dominated the opposition we've played. I so the main team news before the game was Sinclair was missing, and I was actually gutted for the boy because he's been ever present, and uh, I know he took a bad injury against Barcelona, and we wish him all the best for the future. Uh, but we did get to see Roberts and Forrest in the same team, and I was quite excited for that. Uh, Forrest did his best game in a long time, didn't he? Aye. And the way you're saying that, people maybe question how long you're thinking, but I think me and you have been saying that, that he's sort of been a bit quiet for maybe a month or two. Like, yep, yep. It's, it was very pleasing to see, because he just didn't want him to fall back in his three good games and then two months away out kicking the ball but uh, aye he was brilliant I thought he made up more than made up for Sinclair not being on the team aye I thought Forrest did his, his best game in a long time uh, it's quite a difference than a player when he was running with purpose but we'll get to him later right away uh, Aberdeen Derek McInnes is again he threw a curveball uh, towards Celtic and he dropped Niall McGinn but he did bring back Rooney and Madison for this game uh, and Aberdeen decided that they were going to stare down Celtic's huddle. Yeah. You were at the game, what did you make it? Because I can <laughs> tell you... <laughs> As I said to you, I was, I was a bit confused because I thought they were standing for a minute silence. <laughs> but, and I think a few of the Celtic defenders thought that as well, because I'm sure I've seen Jozo walking towards the touchline after the huddle as if he thought that's what it was as well. <laughs> I, I, I must admit, I was just about to say that, I thought the exact same. Yeah. I'd asked my uncle who died uh, to see what the, the minute 
I thought we were going to have a minute's applause or something the way uh, they lined up. But, I mean, I know it's a lot of they're saying they're not scared to be Celtic and they're trying to stay safe to do it. They literally uh, broke their huddle, or their stare, as soon as the huddle finished. I don't think the Celtic players were aware, yeah, or many of them were aware, really but they were yeah. actually up to. Uh, but as soon as the game started, I mean, it was one-way traffic. Yeah. Celtic, well, I thought Celtic were excellent. I don't know about yourself, I mean, I know people say... First half uh, was as well as we've played. Like, yeah. It was, uh, like, like, I keep saying about it, was just complete domination. I think I looked up at the clock in the telly and it was like seven minutes, and I think Aberdeen had only touched the ball about twice. And I just thought that, for the word go, Celtic were just first to every ball. I know people say, oh, Aberdeen, maybe competition's no great, but, but Celtic, I really thought, were thoroughly professional and... The first goal when it came for, for Tom Rogic, is somebody that I've been critical in the last week, uh, actually tweeted at half-time at the Barca game saying he won't be in the team much longer because I think Rogers is going to... You know, when we talk to Rogers, you know, moving his into next level, I think Rogic's position is one of those positions up for grabs, but uh, domestically he continues to be one of our most important players and turning up in a final like that... Uh, I mean, he has just become more important, but his goal was, I mean, it was a great goal. I don't know what kind of view you had for the goal for, for Hamden, but... Aye, you could tell it was a great strike. Like, I was behind the opposite goal, but you could just tell. Uh, I thought Simonovic done brilliant for it as well, because he'd sort of like, he'd gave the ball away, but then just his drive to go and get it to Rogic, and obviously it's a fantastic finish. Yeah, I thought that was key with, with Yozo, was he didn't he just slide in, he, he slid in to win the ball, but he made sure if he did win it, it was going towards Rogic. Uh, I thought it was a great finish, and we didn't really take off it after the gas for then, you know, I thought we, we kept it on, uh, Aberdeen had a chance right, right away after the goal, but I thought uh, the second goal when it came was a great goal, uh, good kind of break up the park, Forrest had a great run, uh, but I know, I know I was screaming for him to pass it. What was your reaction when he was running through and go? Uh, I don't know. I thought he had the right to go because it just sort of summed up how poor Aberdeen were. They, they let one of most dangerous attacking players just run at him for about 10, 15 yards. They just backed off and backed off. And if they're going to do that, then that's that's the one thing that frustrates me with Forrest. He doesn't do that enough and just runs at a man. Like, and obviously the finish was fantastic as well. I thought in many ways it was a similar game to the semi-final. And I thought that if we'd have scored early that day, the game would have went similarly. You know, I thought second goal before half-time was huge. Uh, gave us a 2-0 lead. And, you know, we don't look like conceding one goal, never mind three these days. So, I mean, the, the, we had both odds in the cup really at half-time. Yeah. Uh, Second half, we came out and out again. Aberdeen had enjoyed a wee bit of pressure at the start of the second half, to be fair. And we got the third goal at the right time. Uh, there was no denying it was a penalty you know, on Forrest and, and Dembele took it. I know me and you were on Dembele to score more two goals, so... <laughs> or more, two or more. Uh, good to see him come up and score. And I think with Dembele, is, I don't... <laughs> I know he takes his penalties and he, I know he's only missed the one for us, but I think he just uh, picks a corner and I think he's going to keep going there until he misses and then go, go back across the other way and, uh, until he misses that one. But uh, I thought Dempere was quite quiet on Sunday, to be fair. Aye, uh, he was. I, uh, you. I thought he had, the keeper made a decent enough save at 0 0 from him, but yeah. apart from that, he was pretty quiet. But like, if you can still get a goal in a cup final from your striker when he's particularly having a quiet day and so you can ask for like because he's hold up play and that's brilliant as well now so he's just he is contributing to a lot more parts of the team so it doesn't worry you as much uh, What did you make of the, the atmosphere at the cup final because before the game I must admit everybody was saying oh Aberdeen have won the pre-game battle and that, you know with the fans and I thought it was only on the park it was one way traffic and you know, after the park as well. I mean, you were obviously there, so you've got a better gauge than us. I don't think they won the pre match battle. I think they just put their flags up about 15 minutes earlier. Like they yeah. put their flags up at quarter to three and what, the Celtic display, which was fantastic again. I know yeah. you've got a, a good wee pal 
close to it, but that the green grade they just keep producing fantastic displays and bye as as much as they have uh, Aberdeen fans can have all the flags they want, but like they moaned for a fifty fifty split and there was still noticeable big empty areas, so I think they were just they were drowned out as well. Like Yeah. Now I know people often devalue the League Cup. You know, we've said before that unless you win a treble then it's not really something you look back on fondly and but was that uh, maybe it's just because of the good feeling around the cup at the minute or, or whatever, but I thought that was a genuinely well celebrated trophy. Oh, of course it was, I It was. <sighs> Although like, only one new signing started, it is like a new team, so that's really their first trophy together with Brendan Rodgers. Like, Brendan yeah. Rodgers' first trophy as Celtic manager, you've seen how much it meant to him. I think as well, a lot was made of the restructure of the League Cup, but. I think moving it in November actually almost makes it more important because it means you can get that bit of silverware on the board early and now we don't need to worry about a semi-final in January and the final in March because now we can yeah. put all our efforts to the league in the Scottish Cup. So, and I, like, it's the most, te- like, especially for us, it's the most testing time because of how hectic our schedule has been. Yeah, oh, definitely. Plus, as you say, we moved back to, you know, late January and then middle of March you kind of forget about it and it you know, creeps up on you maybe we've not went into the games as prepared as we should have yeah. and it's maybe cost us success in the League Cup recently and I agree with you wholeheartedly I think that the new, the new structure is, is brilliant I think a lot of credit's got to go to BT Sport because they've really championed the event this year for day one and obviously Betfred the sponsor as well but just a wee nod to BT I think they've really embraced it and uh, maybe maybe more so than a lot of the clubs but as you say I think it makes it a more important trophy you know it, it gives whoever wins it and luckily for us it was this year it was Celtic it gives you that wee bragging right into Christmas and New Year before the Scottish Cup starts and as, as you say I think it can only be a good thing going forward uh, for Scottish football I definitely I so uh, moving on for that uh, after the game, we saw some nice scenes at Celtic Park because it was Celtic's 100th major honour. Uh, and obviously it's a big occasion, net to market. <laughs> was it fate that Brendan Rodgers was here for number 100? I know it just you, felt right. I know you think it is. I mean, aye, probably. Because I think Rodgers is here long term and it's going to down as a historical figure in Celtic folklore, but I it was probably fitting that the start of his tenure was like settling a century of trophies. I'd love to see if we're for the next hundred, but uh... <laughs> I'd love to be here for the next hundred. <laughs> <laughs> Just in, uh, we spoke about earlier celebrations, but at the Celtic Park, no, Brendan Rodgers gave a wee speech. He shook everybody's hand outside. They gave a wee speech, but they actually get quite emotional at the end of it. And then turn that, I get quite emotional watching it. Aye, it was a wee lump in your throat, because you, yeah. you could hear it I, in his voice. I think it just gives you so much pride. You know, it's just so good to be a Celtic fan at the minute. And I know me and you, it, it took a lot of stack last year for for continuing to, you know, kind of support Ronnie Dyer and stuff. And, you know, I would never... Uh, Criticise Johnny Dyer now that he's away and Brendan Rodgers here, but it's just something about Rodgers being the Celtic manager. It, it just feels right, and when he was giving speeches like that, you just think, you know, it's only going to get better. You know, and you've said it already. He is here long term, and I mean, you can't get like that. The, the emotional pull of him winning a league cup. He's not going to. He's not going to just go to Stoke or something is he he's not going to wake up and say nah, going to go to Swansea you know not. he seems to not just football invested but emotionally invested and I know he's made a big uh, thing about his attachment to the club and some people might think it's a wee bit of a tap and it might buy him more time with the fans but I think you can genuinely see you know that how much he's loving it and when he started to choke up on, on Sunday, you thought, well, this guy's here 
rebuild plan, you know, and he's going to make us very proud of the team that we support. Well, he's building the club. You've seen that in the celebrations. Like, he got every single yeah. person, every member of the backroom team, uh, obviously we J as well, like, every single person that was associated with that victory was on the podium. Like, he is building the club. Yeah, I thought it was great. Yeah. I thought it was great when he got everybody, and he seemed that he wouldn't take the trophy up to the to the podium until everybody else was there. I thought that was great, uh, and I think we, you know, we talk about Celtic this season and the Rodgers effect, but surely that you know, now this, now the boys in the team, I know a lot of them had won the league last year and stuff, but your Dembele's, uh, I know he never played in the final, but Sinclair, uh, Roberts, you know, they're all learning to win trophies now. And, you know, Sweet Chenk was one, I know he won the league last year, but Roberts as well, but they won the kind of first cup tournament. It's only, I mean, it's only going to bode well for us in the future. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to put you in the spot, are we going to win the treble? Yes. I say to you in July that if we won the league cup, because it's early, I thought a lot of pressure would be on us with the Champions League and stuff, and I think the team have just been absolutely first class. From now. And I know we're going to talk about the Champions League in a minute because the game last week, but mm. uh, I just want to take a chance to see how how absolutely chuffed he backs up with the team at a minute. Aye. And I think mm. winning the League Cup is testament to not just Brendan Rodgers, but the rest of the team's commitment from uh, what happened at the end of last season to... You know, to get beat off Lincoln Red Amps. A few disses to us that night when we lost to Lincoln Red Amps 1 0. I, we all thought we'd get through in the second leg, but a few disses to us, you'll be unbeaten domestically. You'll be in the mid- middle of a great, you know, goal, uh, you know, great defensive record. You'll know, concede a goal in, you know, about 10 games, and you'll be tapped the league, theoretically, 17 points clear of your nearest rivals. Uh, and you'd win the League Cup, and you know what, you'd give a decent, you know, I think they, they can be maybe slightly disappointed in the Champions League, but we've gave a decent showing of ourselves. When Lincoln Red Amps would beat us, I don't think anybody would have expected that. No, of course not. Uh, well, it was a part-time team, so it was, it was obviously some sort of, it almost felt like a wake-up call, but then we hadn't really started yet, so you can, you can sort of get a bye. And I was sort of convinced we were going to win a treble when that Scottish Cup draw was getting made because I was looking at it and I was thinking, there's absolutely nowhere you fear going. You could get, like, obviously Celtic traditionally getting away tie. I was like, it doesn't matter if it's away at Pataudry, away at Pinecastle, away at Easter Road. We'll go there and win. That's, like, you would, like, like you say, we're, we're Dyla fans and we'll not apologise for it, but you would have worried if he'd have got a Tynecastle Castle or a Pataudry, yeah. like, last season. But this, you just think we're going to win every game. And like you say, we're eight points clear with three games in hand, the second place. Like, we're in such a good place. Yeah, we, we can go we can go 11 points clear a second before Aberdeen, Rangers and Hearts kick a ball. And if Aberdeen beat Rangers, I think the worst will be is... But they don't have, be, aye, they'd be a point. They'd be a point better after. So I'd be like 10 points clear if Hearts don't win and Rangers don't win. Obviously, Aberdeen beat Rangers. So I just <laughs> like as you say in the Lincoln game. I was just trying to bring it up about it, and as you say, give the team a buy for it. It's as if it never happened because it has not held them back whatsoever. There's just been no. I I seen a bit. Oh, I posted a picture from it the other day to show how far we came. But even in that, you've seen there's players that haven't really featured. So you've got like Ambrose, Chiff, J, Ryan Christie. Like, uh, there's quite a lot of players who, I'm not going to say it's because obviously we lost as a team, but there's a lot of that team not really involved, like, and yeah, the few Dem- vital components, aye, like you say. Well, Dembele had just started, Sinclair wasn't there, Toure wasn't there. Uh, Roberts didn't play. Roberts didn't play. Uh, so, I mean, there's a, a few of the boys that obviously didn't feature, but it's as if... It just didn't exist. I mean, I know a couple of Rangers fans were bringing it up, saying, you know, ha-ha Lincoln and stuff, but, I mean, we've took six off them Hi. in two games. What does that say about them, you know? And it seems to be as if even fans of like, other Scottish, they don't want to bring it up anymore because it, 
it has completely been eradicated. It may as well have not happened because Celtic have just went from strength to strength to strength under Rodgers in such a short space of time. So, <laughs> I mean, it was embarrassing when it happened and we all thought, God, you know, this, we were all excited for Rodgers and this has happened. It was like watching the team over the last three or four years. It's just, I mean, I just think it's incredible what's happened so far in only, what you know, six and a half months since he took the job. And long, 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 long may it continue. Yeah, because I think I'm a sick guy already and he's not even away yet. So, before Aberdeen, we played Barcelona in the Champions League and unfortunately we lost 2-0 and we're now due to other results, we are out of Europe completely. Uh, but as I said earlier, I think, don't know if I speak for you, Dan, but uh, I think we've gave a right good account of ourselves in the Champions League. Aye, we... First and foremost, I know I sort of argued against it at the time, but the goal this season was to qualify for the Champions League. There wasn't any attachments to get third or that. And then we done that, and when you look at it, I don't like to make excuses for the team, but it was probably the toughest group we could have put in. Maybe Real Madrid's group with Dortmund was the only one comparable, but that was just such a tough group. And like you say, Barcelona game, the first game aside, we've not been embarrassed by any of the teams and it's three top quality teams three top quality leagues there's the Barca 7-0 game right? I can happen to anybody and unfortunately it happened to us and obviously you don't want to just brush it off because 7-0 is a bit of a doing and I think we have responded well for it there's only one game in my opinion I think we've let ourselves down in and it was a home game against Gladbach I think the other four games you know there were, even, there were flashes in that Barca game you know and it's certainly in the first kind of half an hour well, uh, we gave a good account of ourselves and then, you know, it all went to fuck when, when Barca started scoring that well. But it was just that 90 minutes against Gladbach. But I think if you could give Rodgers a 90 minutes back, he would take that. And I agree with you, but at the same time, that was one of the best displays I've seen for an away team at Celtic Park. I know we went and got oh. a point in Germany, but I thought they were really good as well. Like Although they were a bit patchy in the league, they, that was yep. probably the best I've seen them. No, I agree. I thought they they were good, and I thought that they, they, it was as good in a way performance as you say. As we've seen it, I totally agree. It's just, I just I, I came away for that night thinking we'd let ourselves do that. I don't, I don't think. I think it was maybe just because I've been carried away with how good we were against City, uh, where I thought that, do you know what, we might actually beat Gladbach because I mean, me and you had planned, we'd planned our route to the last sixteen uh, after the Man City game, so. Uh, Maybe we just get a wee bit ahead of ourselves with Gladbach. But I think overall, I don't know if you agree, I think overall it's been a, obviously financially it's been great for us, but I think as a club, as a football team, it's been very worthwhile. Yeah. And obviously we've still got the, the mad side game to come, but I think if you were to look back there, I don't think you would say, oh, we'd rather a run in the Europa League to say the Europa League last 16. Nah, the squad, the squad will have learned more from that, and we've got to hope that we get there next season, and then it would be tough to get a harder group than we did this year, and so yeah. all we can do is just try and qualify again. Like you say, if we'd have, if Bershiva had got an hour goal and put us out, then yeah. I don't think we'd have learned too much about the team, but to come back from an opening day 7-0 defeat to that City performance especially... Uh, yeah. Aye, the team's probably grown a lot. Probably more than what Rogers expected. So where do we go for here then? Uh, in terms of next year? I mean, qualifying. It's qualifying this year. As you say, we, we said at the start, and we're not going to revise, revise history, we knew you said, we don't want to just turn up and make up the numbers. And even though we've only got the two points, I don't feel we've done that. I think we've competed very well. Uh, and I, I don't think they looked at a place last week against Barcelona. I thought no. they had one moment of absolute genius. Their goal was brilliant. The first goal, second goal was a, a penalty, a debatable penalty, whatever. Mm-hmm. I, I just think we've get. I thought we gave a right good account. So I actually thought their second goal came as we were coming right into the game. I actually thought we were a better team at that I think point. It was seventy seconds after Dembele had yep. that header that they got a penalty. So as you say, if Bershiva would have scored again and would have went into Europa League, short of winning the group, and you know. As you say, I don't think we would have learned much. We wouldn't have enjoyed it. And obviously, it would have been great to get into Europa League via the Champions League and go around that way. But 
you know, I, I agree with you. I think qualifying for the Champions League was a great... As we said, we didn't want to just make out the numbers and get humped, but I think we've shown a bit of maturity this year and as next year. Do. But I think next year, the, the, the expectation is, is qualify and don't finish fourth. And as you say, it will be quite hard for us to get a group as hard as that again. But no Celtic, I say exactly, it will probably happen. Oh, Barcelona but, will be in it again, that's a problem. <laughs> ah, yeah, that's right. So Rogers hinted towards, uh, he's hinted a few times towards the season about bringing players in, he certainly did at AGM, about bringing players in the now, well, well, next month in January, to bed them in before the Champions League. Has he seen how important that is? Uh, so do, would you expect us to make a big signing in January? I would expect us to make signings. I don't know what would be classed as a big signing because I think every signing we have brought in has been the first team player. Yeah. Uh, I think this time we probably will lose about six or seven of the, the players that have not been playing, so like your Commons, Chief J, Ambrose, etc. And I think we'll probably bring in about... I think we'll bring in about three or four. I don't think we'll overdo it, but it'll be good. And I think it's important. Like I'd rather we've done our summer spending in January so that they've got three months to get in with the team, win the league, hopefully win the Scottish Cup, and then they're ready to go in July for these next qualifiers and we won't get caught out on the first leg against a, a part-time team again. I think we've just got to start. Our season almost starts again in January to, if we do bring new players in because July is so important for us as a club. I agree, and I think people get a wee bit let down this year because we beat Bishop and never signed anybody. Uh, and people, I think we all agree that we needed another midfielder, and I think that's still a case. But my next point would be: see this whole theory that we need to qualify for the Champions League before making a big signing. I think that's out the window with Rogers. I think Sinclair is a big signing. You know, Toure was a good signing. Uh, I think if Rogers wants somebody, he'll get him in. Ah, well, I think. Sinclair is the one that you should look at because that was done uh, before we qualified. But what was it? He was estimated was it between three and four million. Like, yeah. you've not spent that in a few years. Uh, so I think that was possibly Lawwell and whoever's on the board saying, I will give you this, and if it works, then obviously Rogers can be trusted with money. But it was almost. Well, I hate to bring it back, but the winner gave Ronnie Dyla four million to sign a player. No, no, we are qualified to go. Especially uh, if they were to draw, you know, a team like Bersheva. Uh, but I think I think the point is, is I think Rogers can go and get whoever he wants in January. And there's a lot of talk about James McCarthy again. There's a lot of talk about Snodgrass. I think there are two players I'd like to see in, in as you say, in January to bed them in. And I think Rogers understands how important that is uh, for that to happen. And I just, I just don't think we are bound anywhere by by qualifying for the Champions League. I think we're at a stage where either there'll be two or three players, you know, who maybe no come until we're in the Champions League. But I think the basis of the team, you know, like your Sinclairs and your Tories and stuff, and players like, you know, because a lot of the spine of the team was there. You know, he didn't need to sign a lot, but it's the signings he did make were great. I think this whole qualifying for the Champions League, I think that's finished now. I think it's it's all about Rogers. I think if he wants to get a player in. To, you'll get him and I mean do you think the calf will happen it seems to be the new Robbie Keane rumour as much as what you've just said I think out of the two Snodgrass is a more likely because he is out of contract at the end of the season I think McCarthy would still command yeah. a bit of a fee and again out of the two of them I think McCarthy would link more interest from Premiership clubs as well so I think Snodgrass would be more likely but I would take either or both. <laughs> I, I, I think we'll get both, actually. I, I'd be quite confident of getting both. Uh, especially Snodgrass. I think the thing with, with Snodgrass could be is uh, I think he's a great player, but he's out of contract, so we could sign him. And Hull are virtually relegated anyway. So we could offer them one or two million in January and say, well, you're actually losing them for nothing in the summer, or we'll get them in now. And their season's finished, really, by the shouting. So. Oh, boy. <laughs> I don't want to be a bit sneaky about it, but you could just sign him on a pre-contract first and then do that, and then you've got... That's what I'm saying. Aye, that's aye, what I'm aye. saying. That's what you could already sign them up, and then you go to Hull and say, you know, do you risk losing them? For, you, you're going to lose them for nothing in June, July. 
you know, we'll give you two million now and, and take them or a million and take them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd have no problem with that if it gets them in for, you know, the, the Champions League well, qualifiers. Obviously it was a different time, but we've done that before. We like to, well, tried to do it with, I'm sure we tried to do it with Kelvin Wilson and Adam Matthews. I'm sure we signed them on pretty contracts and tried to get them in, but I we'd probably would I'd be off the gamble. Like, and if you do get them on a free, then it's sort of like a, almost like a ledly situation where you don't need to worry about a fee, so you can probably splash a bit more on wages. Yeah, and I think as well, talking about, uh, just say we do it, we, you know, it's nothing's concrete yet, and it's all rumours, but even if we were to get Snodgrass on a free, and then have to just say pay two million, I think that having him in, a player has quality in, the team before qualifiers start is worth spending two million that we don't necessarily need to because qualifying for the Champions League you get your money back there. Yeah? Oh definitely yeah, it pays itself eh? So apart from the midfield because we I think we're a quality midfielder short eh, especially in Europe I think domestically we're fine I think in Europe we're a, a, a cracking midfielder short somebody that can play forward passes eh, no disrespect to Armstrong or Brown. Uh, Scott Brown's been brilliant for us in the Champions League, by the way, he was excellent last week against Barcelona, but I think we need that player that... You need a pet uh, Yeah, or, 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 or a player that can, you know, get the ball when we're kind of under pressure and play a pass, and he's, you know, he's got players in the wing, Sinclair, Dembele, going through and goal. I think we need a player that can turn the game in our favour. I think, I think they're good on the break, but... You see your goals in the break, like Man City, the Man City goals, like Tierney, Rogic, you know, they're all building up. I think rather than have a player that can play a 30, 40 yard pass that turns a game on its head for us. Uh, but do you think, apart from that, there's any need for another position to be filled? Uh, I know we only play with one up front, but I wouldn't actually mind having another decent striker in. Just a uh, key competition to Dembele and Griffiths and if we do need to shake it up in Europe and change our system, it'd be good to have. I don't know who I'd go for, but I, would, I wouldn't mind having another striker because you're always one injury or suspension away from potential crisis. Hi, we said, was it last year, two years ago, Tyler's first season, or, he said, or was it Lennon's last season, that all our strikers were virtually similar, Stokes and, and Griffiths and that. Mm-hmm. And it sounds kind of cliched, but see... We've no needed to rely on it yet in the league because we've generally been in front of these games. But I wouldn't be against signing a big bruiser up front to throw on the 10, 15 minutes to go. And just, I know it's against Rogers' philosophy and stuff to lob the ball into the box, but I think when you do need to go route one, I know Dembele is a big boy, but I think he does his best work on the ground. And I think we could maybe add a aerial threat further up the park. So you're saying as games. you want a middle back? <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, there's always this face for a middle value back here, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but no, I was thinking more in terms of like, I can have any good ass like player, you know, who, who is good in the air. Uh, I know a lot of people say I'll bring back Samaras, but uh, I'd like to see maybe like, I can have a big bruiser. The kind of way that the Centenary team used Mark McGee, you know, coming off the bench and, and destroying you know, when teams are, are late, uh, kind of tired late on. Nah, well, Mark but, McGee's not interested in being our striker. Nah, <laughs> he's, he's just, he doesn't want a heart's job either. Uh, we, at the back, I think, for the first time ever, we're, we're solid. I, I think a lot of talk, a lot of opinions divided on this next boy I'm about to suggest, but me and you seem to be quite uh, similar. Callum Patterson at Hearts, who's got a contract in the summer, uh, I think we'd like to see him come in, wouldn't we? I will. He's out of contract in the summer and I think I've been banging on about him since he signed that contract because I've been a massive fan of him for two or three years easy. Uh, I think he's a great... I don't even know, I wouldn't even say prospect anymore. I think he's, he's there. Like He's just going to keep continuing to grow and I just have visions of him on one wing and Tierney on the other. And then I, the only other, like we were talking about a scenario last night as well, is that does he replace Lustig or does Lustig just move into the centre? Who knows? Or if, if, if he gets a new deal, that is. I think Lustig will get a new deal. I think he's well respected in the club. I think Rogers recognises he's a big player. 
And just to touch on that point, we and you discussed it last night. I think Lushty could go. To, we could go to a three at the back with two wing backs. Uh, I know Rodgers has tried it a few times, uh, and I don't think he's got a balance right. We kind of well, it was Roberts he was playing on the right hand side and KT on the left. I think if he'd have played like Patterson, who's naturally right sided, to go down the line. I mean, I think Patterson's a good player. I, I don't think he's a great player. I think I'd like I'd like to see Rodgers work on him. I think Rodgers could get a lot out of him. Uh, like he seems to do with, with other boys. I think Rogers could get an awful lot out of him. Uh, I like him. I've liked him for a while, like yourself. Uh, I thought it was really good last night. Uh, when Hearts beat Rangers, I thought he had a good game. And he's got a long throw, you know, that can cause trouble as well. He's got a few weapons up his sleeve. Uh, and I don't think he's too uh, keen to stay at Hearts, judging by his post-match, in that post-match interview last night. He, he didn't seem to brush off any speculation uh, about his future, but... That's that would be one for our time. Some people are saying that we Rogers could have moved away for signing SPL players, but I think young Scottish players are, would always I be well. I, I think we are just signing quality players. So that doesn't mean that you can't sign a player from yeah. the SPL. Like, it's worthless. I don't think we'll ever be completely finished with signing players from other SPL teams. I yes. I think that as well. I think if if they're good enough, it doesn't matter where they are. And I think Rogers could could do a lot of work with a player like Patterson, uh, and I think he could complement the team the team very well. Uh, so we move on for that. Uh, as we mentioned before, we uh, finish with a wee bit of fun. Uh, Sunday was Celtic's one hundredth trophy. Now me and you are still quite young, uh, so we've not seen all of them. Uh, but out of the ones you were alive for, Dan, what's been your favourite Celtic trophy? Ooh, tough one. Uh, the Wembley Cup. Ah, <laughs> 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 uh, probably the 06 07 league title, just because of the circumstances with Tommy Burns. Obviously, it was it just seemed to mean a lot, and with it being a last day as well. Uh, that was two two thousand and eight. Oh, aye, sorry, I'm thinking yeah. aye. Aye, Seven, that, that, aye. That, that, that was my one as well. Yeah, just as you, as you say, it was the way the league, the league was won, and uh, as you say, there's a lot of emotional attachment eh, towards it. Also, the Scottish Cup uh, in two thousand eleven. Yeah, because I thought Celtic had been really good that year, and we things that happened to Neil Lennon after part of stuff and losing the league. Prior that, I thought Celtic really deserved a trophy that year, and the Scottish Cup, I, I quite enjoyed that. Uh, obviously, league title 98, but I was only five then. I kind of really, uh, I remember some of it, but not really the significance of winning it until now. Um, but what's been your favourite cup win rather than league that you were here for? Eh. Uh, league Cup we won against Rangers, what was it? It was running about the same time. It was striking. It was one day and yeah, the yeah. They scored that was my uh, first cup final. Aye, I wasn't at that, but it was. I enjoyed that. Uh, Scottish cups are quite <laughs> in a weird way. I sort of enjoyed the uh, Scottish Cup final two thousand and four. Was it when Dumbay scored, or was it slightly later? Dumbay would have been 2007, and it was one of the worst cup finals <laughs> I've ever seen. I actually fell asleep and then woke up. <laughs> but I just remember that being quite a good day. I told Joe Dimby a slide tackle. Uh, so a wee bit more thought needed. Apart from Lisbon, if there was one trophy that you were only here for that you could have been, uh, what would that have been? I think it's got to be Love Street into 86. Uh, see, I was I was thinking Love Street 86 or, or the centenary season or uh, the 7 1 game. Mm hmm. Uh, I think there's a few I'd love to. I think the 86 would have just been so good with that happening. Yeah. And obviously with technology and nowhere it is today, it would have just yeah. been so good with one guy with his radio. Aye, uh, tell him about Al- that. Aye, him about Albert Kidd. That's a, uh, there's a great fact in the video they gave me. It's a man and keep a picture of hope and you just see a guy with a radio <laughs> attached to his ear just start celebrating. <laughs> and people run about him are looking as if he's at a gold start. And as you said... That was great, but I think about what we've had to go through. You know, many I don't think I've seen apart from two thousand and eight. I don't think I've seen uh, in ninety eight. I don't think I've seen Celtic win the league in the last day. You know, we've lost it oh five, oh uh, three, oh nine, 
or uh, you know, two thousand eleven, you know, so to to have been there he won the league in the last day would have been especially when we weren't expected to win it. Aye. That would have you know, not just having to win in Hope Hearts could be but they had to win by three or four goals, you know what I mean? Not a five nothing up. It must have just have been a, a great day to be there. Definitely. So to finish this week, we are away to Motherwell on Saturday, which should actually be quite a tough game because Motherwell are quite good uh, when they when they want to be when they turn up. They're, they're quite a decent team, I especially. Think I, they, they got a bit of a doing last week at Hearts, but in that same game, yep. I think they'd look, it was four or five off the line, so probably flattered Hearts a bit. And then I think the week before, me and you both had Motherwell on our team, so we know that they beat part at Fessel at home. But yep. uh, aye, that's. Maybe not as much in recent seasons, but it has been a bit of a difficult one for us. But uh, I just can't see past this team. Like, obviously, we've got Tuesday come against Man City, but I can't see that having too much of a bearing effect. No, I think you. I don't think we'll play a weekend team in, in Tuesday by any means, but I think the Saturday comes first now. And I think with the the thing as well, with certainly with Celtic, uh, like in terms of Rangers, it's a real chance to put pressure on them by winning it adds you know I know people say oh, Celtic winning it doesn't matter what they're doing but it's just true and, you know they're not going to challenge us anyway but purely for a, a rivalry point of view there's a lot going on there at the minute if we win on Saturday it puts just even more pressure on them to beat Aberdeen and whereas whereas we've went from like last week when they scored against uh, Partick Thistle people were saying well, there's a chance. Sorry, when they scored against the day, people are saying there's a chance that they'll be five behind us the next time we play in the league. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, but they they could no. So they've went for five behind us to potentially eleven. But before they play next, so the pressure, you know, the pressure they put on them, and as you say, I, I think can I see past Celtic at a minute. It, I, I keep thinking, well, you know, it's got to come in sometime, but. You know, I'd be shocked if we lost a goal at the minute. You know, we're just so good. Uh, we're like a very good, well-oiled machine at the minute. Uh, which brings me to... I'm going to ask you for a prediction in a minute, but have you any other thoughts on the Motherwell game? Or, uh, uh, no, I just wanted to know what you thought about Rodgers was at the day saying that he's looking forward to seeing Gary Mackay Stephen. Uh, Come on, do you think he could do a similar job to what he's done with Forrest and get the best out of him? He'd like to think so. I think Gary McKay Stevens a wee bit unlucky that he's been out injured. Uh, and he seems to have taken the flack for the semi-final uh, defeat last year to the Rangers. A lot of people seem to have threw him under the bus for it, where his, you know, cold light of day, everybody was absolutely disgusting that day. Uh, he was very poor, by the way, let's not get away from it, but I think he seems to have took a wee bit more stick than most. Uh, I'd like to see it. I mean, you never say never. Uh, I'd like to see him. Uh, Rogers, it looks as like if he's got to come on Sunday for a while. Uh, he seemed to be sent to train a few times, uh, and I think yeah, Rogers. <laughs> I've criticised Rogers for us in the past that he's a wee bit egotistical, and I thought the signing of Baratelli. Kinda, I know he's come out and said that it wasn't really him that signed him, but I always thought with Rogers, he likes to maybe blow his own trunk up a bit. So he, but it's worked so far at Celtic. You know, with players like Forrest and and. Uh, Certainly Armstrong has come, come right on a game recently. So I think if Rogers thinks he can get a tune out of Mackay Stephen, then we just need to have a wee bit of uh, faith in him. Uh, I mean, I don't know what you feel about Mackay Stephen, but no, I, it's I, sort of, I, I don't mind Gary Mackay Stephen. I think he's a bit quiet right. in bigger games, but at the same time, domestically he's probably fine. Uh, it sort of caught me off guard when he was off the bench last week because... I knew he was injured in pre-season, but I thought he was just completely out of favour. It wasn't until yeah. I seen Rogers saying that that was him fit again, and he was impressed with him that I thought, aye, maybe. Like you wouldn't rule it out. Like he's still relatively young, and he's mid twenties, and aye, why not? Yeah, I think the resurgence of Forrest is giving everybody a wee bit of hope, and if I think Mackay Stephen, I don't think that he's much worse for us. So if he can get, uh, I mean, I, I quite like the guy Stephen an awful lot. I think if Rogers believes he can get a tune out of him, then we just need to have a bit of patience. But I think uh, the thing as well that would be good if you could get uh, some form out of Mackay Stephen is that obviously Paddy Roberts is away in a few months, so it would be good to have another wide option. That's what I was going to say. It's another uh, 
<laughs> it's an, as you say, it's another option, and it's it seems to be that I mean, we've seen it with Rogic, you know, who I know Dyla brought Rogic through, uh, but Lennon signed him, and Rogic was completely out of the picture. Now, now look at him, you know, so you would never rule um, like that out. But as you say, it's all about different options, and I still think I think they'll replace Roberts in the summer. I think uh, I don't think Roberts will stay. I think he's been with the team too long now. I think uh, he'll probably go back to City and then drift away on loan. He'll probably end up at a, you know a Stoke or maybe top end of Championship, but on half the Premiership. Uh, I know you're a big fan of Paddy Roberts like myself, but I don't know. I just can't see him staying. I don't think he'll stay either. And. If and I'm I know you're really honest. I don't think you'll be missed. <laughs> like, well, obviously you'll be missed by the fans, but you will miss The quality of the team won't yeah. suffer. I don't think. Yeah, and I, th- I don't think that's a slight on on Paddy Roberts. I think that's just how well the team have been playing. And I think I like Robert. I like him a lot. He's a great wee player. I think there's, there's fewer better sights than when he's in full flow, and we've we've not seen it as much this season, uh, which is a bit of a shame. But you know, God bless him. He, He's, uh, you know, he never shies away, Robert. I think that's the thing. We've seen him come off the bench in European games and he's added something, you know, a wee bit of flair. So, as you say, I don't think the club will miss him uh, drastically, as you say, but I think he'll be doing as a, a player that, you know, enjoyed his time at Celtic. I always just uh, fond words on that, I say. But just before I forget, cause I've been meaning to ask you for a couple of minutes, uh, the media I make now, and they were talking about Aberdeen and they're saying their biggest test is, is, is Friday is against Rangers at Ibrox some are suggesting that it's Celtic's biggest test so can I, I was going to say if we do this can we do but can Celtic go through the season unbeaten and or does it or do you want to wait to after how many do you think that no no I think our toughest test came probably in the first day of the season that's no to say we will go unbeaten. I think we definitely can, but it only takes one off day. And yeah, I mean, I, exactly, I agree with you. I think your toughest game of the season was the first day of the season. Uh, and it's just that I think whether, I mean, I think Rangers are absolutely poor. I think we should be beating them comfortably. Either. It's still going to be a big occasion for the players because only Scott Brown and Lee Griffiths, has Griffiths played there? I dare say he's played with Hibs. I don't think he has played there, Griffiths. I think only Scott Brown has played there. I can't remember Lustig. I don't think Lustig played there against them. Forrest, so, maybe. Forrest as well. So Craig Gordon will have been there too. But I don't think there's many in that squad that have been there. So it'll be a big test for them. You know, it's an occasion. I, th- I think if they go through that, they can. I think they can go through the season unbeaten, I think. But as you say, it's that off day. Yeah. It's required, but. It depends on the term. manager is at the time as well, so I think that Wolves might do a magic disappearing act after Saturday, but we'll see. Yeah, well, if Derek McInnes is there, then we can definitely. We'll be unbeaten at Ibrox for a, for a long time. Uh, so it's just if will we still be unbeaten at half past two on Saturday? I hope so, because I've still got a bet on it, so <laughs> I certainly hope you're get, so. You're getting 91, your money, the new. Oh, I've really? seen that. Ah, you get nine one for Celtic to go season unbeaten. I seen it last I night. I think that's value yeah. in the Europe because the full focus just, will be on I, domestic. I, I, I the only worry is that we win the league by thirty five points and we play a youth team for after the split. Yeah, but if we win the league, we're still in the Scottish Cup. There's a chance of going through the entire domestic season unbeaten. Right. That would be even beyond anybody's wildest dreams. But I, I think, I think we will beat Motherwell, and I think, I think, I think we'll win four 0 and we'll go for. <laughs> Scott Brown, you get a goal. I've been quite generous so far. Recently, I've been gaining Celtic 5 and 6. I think Celtic will score three goals on Saturday and I think we'll get a hat trick from Stenberry. And I think his third will be a left at volley. So, all that remains to be said now is if you've made it as far as us then we've got nothing but respect for you uh, we will be back uh, hopefully in the studio again next week uh, but if we know then we'll definitely get something towards you because December is a very busy month for Celtic so oh, I know we'll I'm be... thinking, uh, uh, just as a preempt, we might do a 
Friday night match companion, as shown on Fantastic Podcast, because we're playing next Friday night. <laughs> well, we were muting that uh, we were muting a very special Christmas episode where me and you just get absolutely blistered and <laughs> <laughs> started greeting about Paddy Roberts came back to my side. <laughs> Still <possible>. but, <laughs> I think with December being such a busy month, there's definitely going to be stuff coming for us. So, uh, and a, a lot of thanks if you've made us far, because I know there's a lot of non Celtic chat at the start of today's podcast. But we just felt with what's going on in the world, and you know, you've got a, a Celtic fan working abroad who is clearly very learned, very intelligent, and got a lot of knowledge about the situation. I thought we thought it was quite right to kick him on and, and discuss it. Uh, for people who maybe don't know so much so I know there's a wee bit of time before the Celtic content kicked in this week but we thank you for your your dedication to the show uh, because we are reaching how many episodes have we done now have we? probably on about 30 or 40 ah uh, so we're approaching NBR 50 and then we can have a wee which your favourite pod and which your favourite one you've missed and stuff, uh, but as I say, I so keep it, keep your eye out for uh, podcasts cannot think fast because Celtic have the guts of 10 games in December, so we'll not cover every single one, but we're going to do our best because we'll try and, and have, we'll try and have some special guests. I know there was a lot of good feedback for David last week, and yeah, I'm 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 preempting it by saying that I think you'll enjoy the interview we've done with Ewan as well. Yeah, definitely. I think it was a very good interview, and I think you should say with David as well. He's he's keen. I think he's uh, a wee bit starstruck by the comments he was getting. Stopped in the street. Aye, somebody stopped the street. I know that voice. (laughs) (laughs) But aye, I mean, before we... Where can people find you, then? You can find me anywhere in Glasgow, I'm usually at a gig, but... (laughs) <laughs> no, you can find me at OC Boy. Um, you can find me at Respect the Pod NBR yeah, because my personal Twitter is private now. So, uh, <laughs> as I say, thanks for listening. And if you get any final thoughts, Dan, as we enter this festive period, I don't know, just prepare to give your heart to Brendan Rodgers this Christmas. Indeed, aye, yeah. It's a lot more in my heart. I want to give that man, but that's for a different podcast. So, yeah, thanks for listening and hail, hail. <laughs>